President Bashar al-Assad of Syria, thank you very much for talking to RT today. You're most welcome in Damascus. So, you know, many people were convinced a year ago that you wouldn't make it this far. But yet again, we're sitting in a newly renovated presidential palace and recording this interview. Who exactly is your enemy at this point? My enemy is terrorism, the instability in Syria. This is our enemy. It's not about people. It's not about persons. Uh, the whole issue is not about me staying or leaving. It's about the country being safe or not. Mm -hmm. So this is the enemy that we've been fighting as Syrians. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been here for the last two days and I had a chance to talk to a couple of people from Damascus. Some of them say that whether you stay or go doesn't really matter at this point anymore. What do you say to that? I think the, for the president to stay or to leave is a popular issue. It's not a personal issue. Mm -hmm. And the only way to define this uh, uh, term precisely through the ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. So it's not about what we hear, it's about what we can get through that box. And that box will tell any president to stay or leave very simply. I think what they meant was that at this point you are not the target anymore, Syria is. Uh, it, I wasn't the target, I wasn't the problem mm -hmm. anyway. You know the West always created enemies. It was the communism, then it became the Islam, then it became Saddam Hussein for different reasons, and now they wanted to create a new enemy as Bashar. So they said the problem is the president, so he has to leave. That's why we have to focus on the real problem, not to waste our time listening to what they say. But do you personally believe, still believe, that you are the only man who can hold Syria together and the only man who can put an end what the world calls a civil war? Uh, we have to look at it from two aspects. The first aspect is the Constitution, and I have my authority through the Constitution. According to this, uh, to this authority and to the Constitution, I have to be able to solve the problem. But if, uh, if we mean it that you don't have any other Syrian who can be president, no. Any Syrian could be president. We have many Syrians who are eligible to be in that uh, posi position. You cannot uh, uh, link the whole country only to one uh, person always. But you're fighting for your country. Do you believe that you are the man who can put end to the conflict and restore peace? I have to be the man who can do that, and I hope so. I have. But it's not about the power of the president. It's about the whole society. Mm -hmm. I have to be precise about this. The president cannot do anything without institutions and without uh, support of the people. So the fight now is not the president's fight. It's Syrian's fight. Every Syrian is involved in defending his country now. It is and a lot of civilians are dying as well in the fighting. So if you were to win this war, how would you reconcile with your people after everything that has happened? Let's be, uh, again, more precise. The problem is not between me and the people. I don't have a problem with the people because the United States is against me. The West is against me. Many Arab countries, including Turkey, which is not Arab, of course, against me. And if the, people, if the Syrian people are against me, how can I be here? They're so not against you. How They're can not I say against you. If the whole world, or let's say a big part of the world, including your people against you, are you a superman? Mm -hmm. You're just a human being. So this is not logical. So it's not about reconciling with the people. And it's not about reconciliation between the Syrian and the Syrian. You don't have civil war. Mm -hmm. It's about terrorism and support coming from abroad to support terrorists to destabilize Syria. This is our war. You still don't believe it's a civil war because I know that there's a lot of, except for terrorism, which everyone believes takes place in Syria, there's also a lot of confession-based strife. For example, we all heard about the mother who has two sons. One son is fighting for the government forces, another one is fighting for the rebel forces. How is this not a civil war? You have division, but division doesn't mean civil war. It's completely different. Civil war should be based on ethnical problem or sectarian problem. Sometimes you may have sectarian or ethnical tension, and tension doesn't mean problem. So if you have division in the same family or in a bigger tribe or whatever, or in the same city, it doesn't mean civil war. This is completely different, and that's normal. You, can, you, should, you should expect that. When I uh, asked about reconciling with your people, this is what I meant. I've heard you say on many different occasions that the only thing you care about is what Syrian people think of you and what Syrian people feel towards you and whether you should be a president or not. Aren't you afraid that at the end of the day, because there's been so much damage done to the country, yeah. that they won't care about the truth, but they will just blame you? Yeah, this is a hypothetical question because uh, what, what the people think is the right thing. So what they think, we have to, to ask them. 
but uh, I don't have this information uh, right now. So again, I'm not afraid about uh, I'm not afraid about what they think about me. I'm afraid about my country. We have to be focused on that. Okay, you know, for years there has been so many stories about almighty Syrian army, omnipotent Syrian secret services, but then we see that you know the government forces aren't able to crush the enemy like people expected it would. And we see terrorist attacks take place in the middle of Damascus almost every day. Um, mm. Were there myths about the Syrian army and about the strong Syrian secret services? Uh, usually uh, when you have army, when you have secret intelligence, these things should focus on external enemy, mm -hmm. not internal enemy. Even if you have internal, internal enemy like terrorism, uh, you have society that could help you at least not to uh, provide the terrorists with incubator. Mm -hmm. In that case, it's a new kind. We have a new kind of war. Terrorism through proxies. Either Syrians mm -hmm. living in Syria or foreigner fighters coming from abroad. So it's a new style of war. This is first. So you have to adapt with this new style. It takes time. It's not easy. Okay. And to say this is easy, as easy as a normal or let's say traditional or regular war, no. It's much more difficult. Second, the support that they've been had that's been offered to those terrorists in every aspect, armaments, money, political, is unprecedented. So you have to expect that it's going to be tough war and difficult war. You don't, say, you don't expect a small country like Syria to defeat all those countries that have been fighting us through proxies mm -hmm. just in days or weeks. Yeah, because when you look at it, I mean, on one hand, you have one leader with the army. He tells his army, go straight, go left, go right, and the army obeys. On the other hand, you have fractions of terrorists who have no one to unify them, exactly. no unified strategy to fight you. So how does that really happen when it comes to uh, fighting each other? This is another aspect of the problem, that those uh, terrorists fighting from within the cities. In the cities, you have civilians. When you, when you fight this kind of... Uh, Terrorists, you have to be aware that you, uh, you, do, you should do the minimal, minimum damage to the infrastructure and minimum uh, damage to the civilians, because you have civilians and you have to fight. You cannot leave terrorists just killing and destroying. So this is the difficulty in these kinds uh, of war. You know, the infrastructure, uh, military infrastructure, economy is suffering. It's almost as if like Syria is going to fall into decay very soon and the time is against you. In your opinion, how much time do you need to crush the enemy? Uh, you cannot answer that question because no one claimed that he had the answer about when to, to, uh, to end the war, unless we have the answer when they're going to stop smuggling foreign fighters from different uh, parts of this uh, world, especially the Middle East and the uh, Islamic world, and when they're going to stop sp sending armaments to those uh, terrorists. If they stop, this is where, you can, I, where I can answer you. I can tell you in weeks you can finish everything. It's not a big problem. But as long as you have continuous supply in, in men and armaments and everything else and logistics, it's going to be a uh, long-term uh, war. And also, when you think about it, you have 4,000 kilometers of loosely controlled borders. So you have your enemy that can at any time cross over Jordan or Turkey, rearm, get medical care, and come back to fight you. Exactly. How actually, exactly you actually deal with no country in the world can seal the border. Sometimes they use this word, which is not correct. Even the United States cannot seal its border with Mexico, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the same uh, for Russia, which is a big country. So no country can seal the, uh, the border. You can only have better bo situation on the border when you have good relation with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Something that we don't have, at least with Turkey now. Turkey's uh, support uh, uh, more than any other country the smuggling of armaments and terrorists. Can I ask you something? I've been in Turkey recently and people there are actually very worried that war will happen between Syria and Turkey. Do you think a war with Turkey is a realistic scenario? Rationally, no, I don't think in that regard. For, for two reasons. The war needs public support and the majority of the Turkish people don't need this war. So I don't think any rational official would think about going against the will of the public in his country. The same for the Syrian people. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, the, the conflict or the difference is not between the Syrian people and the Turkish people. It's about the government and the official, between, between our official and their official because of their uh, politics. So I don't see any war 
between Syria and Turkey in the horizon. When is the last time you spoke to Erdogan and how did the talk end? Uh, May 2011, mm -hmm. after he won the elections. So you just congratulated him? Yeah, for, just And that for was that. the last time? It was the last time. Who is shelling Turkey? Uh, the government forces or the rebels? Uh, in order to, uh, to, have the, to find the answer, you need a joint committee between the two armies in order to know who shell who. Uh, because on the borders you have a lot of terrorists who have uh, mortars, so they can do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go investigate uh, the bomb uh, itself, the place, and so on. And that didn't happen. We asked the uh, Turks, uh, the Turkish government, to have this committee. They refused. So you cannot have the answer. But when you have this terrorist on your border, you don't exclude uh, them from doing so, because the Syrian army doesn't have any order to shell the Turkish land, because you don't, we don't find any interest in this, and we don't have any enmity with the Turkish people. We consider them as brothers, so why to do it? Unless that happens by mistake, you need the investigation. So far we don't have the answer. Because so of you the accept that it may be mistakenly uh, from the government forces? That, that could happen, this possibility. In every war you have mistakes. You know in, in, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan they always talk about friendly fire. Mm -hmm. If you can kill your soldier, so that um, it means in every war that could happen, mm -hmm. but we cannot say yes. Tell me something, why has Turkey that you call a friendly nation become a foothold for the opposition? Not, the, not Turkey, only Erdogan's government, mm -hmm. only, just to be precise, not the Turkish people. Turkish people need good relation with the Syrian people. This is Erdogan, I think he believes that if Muslim Brotherhood take over in the region, and especially in Syria, he can guarantee his political future. This is one reason. The other reason, personally, he thinks that he is the new Sultan of the Ottoman, and he can control the region as it was during the Ottoman Empire under a different, let's say, umbrella, which is the Islamic, but not the Ottoman Empire, not to be Khalifa, but in his heart he thinks that he's Khalifa. Mm -hmm. These are the main two uh, reasons for him to change or to shift his policy from zero friends, uh, sorry, zero problems to zero friends. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the West that opposes you at this point. You have so many enemies in the Arab world. Why? And that's to say, like two years ago, um, when someone heard your name in the Arab world, they would straighten their ties. And now on the first occasion, they betray you. Why do you have so many enemies in the Arab world? They're not enemies. Some of them, the majority of the Arab uh, governments support Syria in their heart, okay. but they don't dare to uh, say that explicitly. Why not? Under pressure by the West, sometimes under pressure by the petro petrodollar in the Arab world. Who supports you from the Arab world? Uh, many countries support Syria uh, by their heart, but they uh, don't dare to say that explicitly. But uh, first of all, Iraq. Iraq uh, plays a very active role in supporting Syria during the crisis because it's a neighboring country and they understand and they recognize that if you have war in, inside Syria, you will have war in the neighboring country, including uh, Iraq. Uh, I think uh, other countries, uh, uh, they have a good position like uh, Algeria, uh, Oman, uh, mainly, mainly those other countries. And other countries, uh, I wouldn't uh, count all of them, but uh, I would say they, are, they have positive uh, position, but uh, without taking actions. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, why are they so adamant about you resigning? And how would an unstable Middle East fit their agenda? Uh, let's be frank, I, I, don't have, I cannot ans answer on their behalf. They mm -hmm. have to answer that question. But I, what I could say, that the problem between Syria and many countries, mm -hmm. whether in the Arab world, or regional, or in the West, that we keep saying no when we think that we have to say no. That's the problem. And some countries, they believe that they can control Syria through orders or through money or petrodollars, and this is impossible in Syria. This is the problem. They, maybe they want to play a role. We don't have problem. They can play a role. Whether they deserve or not, they can play a role. But not to play a role at the expense of our interests. But is it about controlling Syria or about exporting their vision of Islam to Syria? Uh, you cannot put it as a government policy sometimes. Sometimes you have institutions in certain 
countries. Sometimes you have personnel who try to promote this, but they don't announce it offic as official uh, policy. So they didn't ask us to promote their, let's say, extremist uh, attitude mm -hmm. of their institutions. But that happens. In reality, that happens, whether through indirect support of their government or through the foundation from the institution and the personnel. So this is part of the problem. But when I want to talk as government, I have to talk about the announced uh, policy. Uh, the announced policy is like any other policy, that it's about interests, it's about playing a role. But we cannot ignore what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, Iran, which is a very close ally, also exposed to economic sanctions, also facing a threat of military invasion. Mm. If you were faced with an option, cut ties with Iran mm -hmm. in exchange of peace in your country, would you go for it? There's no contradiction. I don't have this uh, contradicting option. Why? Because we had good relation with Iran since 79 till today, and it's getting better every day. But at the same time, we are moving toward the peace, and we had peace uh, process, we had peace negotiations. Iran wasn't a factor against peace. So this is misinformation uh, they try to promote in the West that if we, if we need peace, we don't have to have good relation with Iran. There's no relation. It's completely two different subjects. Iran supported Syria, supported our cause, our, uh, the cause of the occupied land, and we have to support them in their cause. That's uh, very simple. Iran is a very important country in the region. If we, if we, are, looking, if we are looking for stability, mm -hmm. we need good relation with Iran. You cannot talk about stability while you have bad relation with Iran, with Turkey, with your neighbors and so on. This is it. Do you have any information that the Western intelligence are uh, financing rebel fighters here in Syria? No, so far what we know that they are uh, offering the knowledge support of mm -hmm. the terrorists through Turkey, sometimes in Lebanon, uh, uh, mainly. Uh, but we have well, the, the other intelligence, not the Western, in the region, some of them are very active, more active than the Western, under the supervision of the Western intelligence. Mm -hmm. What's the role of Al-Qaeda in Syria at this point? Are they controlling any of the rebel coalition forces? No, they, they, I don't think they're looking to control. They, they look to have your, their own, let's say, kingdom or, or imarat mm -hmm. uh, in, in their uh, language. But uh, mainly now they try to scare the people through explosion, assassination, suicide bombers, mm -hmm. things like this, to push the people toward desperation and uh, to accept them as a reality. So they go step by step. But their final aim is to have this, uh, let's say, Islamic Emirate in Syria, where they can uh, uh, promote their own ideology in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. From those who are fighting you and those who are against you, who would you talk to? We talk to anyone who has genuine will to help Syria. But we don't waste our time with anyone who wants to, to use our crisis for his own personal interests. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you've been many times, not you, but the government forces have many times been accused of war crimes against their own civilians. Do you accept that the government forces have committed war crimes against their own civilians? We are fighting terrorism. We are uh, implementing our constitution uh, uh, by uh, protecting the Syrian people. Let's go back to, to, to what happened in Russia more than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you faced uh, the terrorism in Chichen and other places. They uh, attack people in theaters, schools, and so on. And uh, the army in uh, Russia protected the people. Would you call it uh, war crime? No, uh, you wouldn't. A few days ago, uh, Amnesty International recognized the crime that, they, that was committed a few days ago when they captured uh, soldiers and executed them. And the Human Rights Watch uh, recognized more than once about the uh, crimes of those terrorist groups, and it was described a few days ago as uh, war a crime. Uh, this is the first point. The second point, if you have army that committed crime against its people, this is devoid of logic because the Syrian army is made up of Syrian people. If you want to commit crime against your people, the army will divide, will disintegrate. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have strong army, unified army, while you're killing your people. Third, the army cannot withstand for 20 months in these difficult circumstances without having the embrace of the public in Syria. So how could you have, could you have this embracement while you're killing your people? This is contradiction. So uh, this is the answer. Um, when is the last time you've spoken to a Western leader? Uh, before the crisis. It was before the crisis. Before the crisis. Um, 
were there any time at which they tried to give you conditions that if you left the post of presidency, then there will be peace in Syria or no? No, with me directly, no. Uh, but whether they propose that uh, directly or indirectly, it's a matter of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Only the Syrian people will talk about this. Whoever talk about this in the media, in a statement, directly or indirectly, has no meaning and has no weight mm -hmm. uh, in, Syria, in Syria. So, no. But, you know, do you even have a choice? Because from what it seems from the outside, even if you wanted to go, you wouldn't have anywhere to go. Exactly. Where would you go if you wanted to leave? To Syria. <laughs> I would go from Syria to Syria. This is the only place where we can live. I'm not a puppet. I wasn't, made by, I wasn't made by the West to go to the West or to any other country. Mm -hmm. I'm Syrian. I'm made, uh, uh, I'm made in Syria. And I have to live in Syria and die in Syria. Do you think that at this point there could be talks or diplomacy or we've reached a stage where only the army can do no, the thing? I always believe in diplomacy. I always believe, and I always, be, I always believe in dialogue, even with people who doesn't understand, who doesn't believe in, in dialogue. You have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. Whether you succeeded or not, I, I think you always have partial uh, success. You have to, to look for this partial success before you, look for the, before you achieve the complete success. But you have to be realistic. You don't think that only dialogue can make you achieve something, because those people who commit these acts there are two, two, two kinds. One of them doesn't believe in dialogue, especially the extremists. Uh, and uh, you have the outlaws who have been convicted by the court mm -hmm. years ago before the, uh, the crisis. And their natural enemy is the government, because they're going to be detained if you had a normal situation, let's say. Uh, the other part of them is the people who has been supplied by the outside. And they, are only, they can only be committed to the people or to the government who spend, who pay them the money mm -hmm. and supply them with armament. They don't have choice, they don't have decision, they, they don't own their own decision. So you have to be realistic. And you have the third part of the people, whether he's militants or politicians, who can accept the dialogue. That's why we've been in, in, in this dialogue for a month now, even with militants. And many of them give up their armaments and they went back to their normal life. Do you think a foreign invasion is imminent? I think uh, the price of this invasion, if it's happened, is going too big, more than the whole world can afford. Because if you have problem in Syria, and we are the last stronghold of secularism and stability in the region, and coexistence, uh, let's say, it will have a domino effect that affect the world from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And you know the, the, the implication of the rest, on the rest of the world. I don't think uh, the, the West is going in that uh, regard. But if they do so, nobody can tell what's next. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, do you blame yourself for anything? Normally, you have to find mistakes. You do it with, with every decision. Otherwise, you're not a human. What's your biggest mistake? What I don't remember, to be very frank mm -hmm. uh, now. But we are always, but I always, even before taking the decision, I have to to, record, to, to consider that part of it will, will be wrong. But you cannot tell about your mistake now. Sometimes, if, especially during crisis, you don't see what's right and wrong until you overcome uh, the situation that you are uh, in. So it's not, I wouldn't be objective to talk about mistakes now, mm -hmm. because you're still in the middle of the of So the you crisis. don't have regrets yet? Not now, as it when, when, when everything is clear, you can talk about your mistake. But okay. you definitely have mistakes. That's you know. If today was 15th of March 2011, that's when the uh, protests started to escalate and grow. What would you do differently? What I would do, I would do what I did. Exactly the, 15th the same. 15th of uh, March, exactly the same. To start to ask the different parties to for to have dialogue and to stand uh, against the terrorists. Because that's how it started. It didn't start as March. It, the cover was, the umbrella was marshes, but within those marshes you had militants who started shooting the civilians and the army at the same time. Maybe on the tactical level you could have done something different, but as president you're not tactical. You always take the decision on strategic level, which is different. President Al-Assad, how do you see yourself in 10 years' time? In 10 years, through my country, I cannot see myself. I can see my country in 10 years' time. This is where I can see myself. Uh, more you see yourself in Syria? Uh, definitely. I have to be in Syria. It's not about the position. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see myself whether president or not. That's not my, my interest. 
I could see myself in this country, safe country, stable country, more prosperous country. President Bashar al-Assad of Syria, thank you for talking to our team. Thank you for coming to Syria again. President Bashar al-Assad of Syria, thank you very much for talking to RT today. You're most welcome in Damascus. So, you know, many people were convinced a year ago that you would make it this far. But yet again, we're sitting in a newly renovated presidential palace and recording this interview. Who exactly is your enemy at this point? My enemy is terrorism, the instability in Syria. This is our enemy. It's not about people. It's not about persons. Uh, the whole issue is not about me staying or leaving. It's about the country being safe or not. Mm -hmm. So this is the enemy that we've been fighting as Syrians. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been here for the last two days and I had a chance to talk to a couple of people from Damascus. Some of them say that whether you stay or go doesn't really matter at this point anymore. What do you say to that? I think the, for the president to stay or to leave is a popular issue. It's not a personal issue. Mm -hmm. And the only way to define this uh, uh, term precisely through the ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. So it's not about what we hear, it's about what we can get through that box. And that box will tell any president to stay or leave very simply. I think what they meant was that at this point you are not the target anymore, Syria is. Uh, it, I wasn't the target, I wasn't the problem mm -hmm. anyway. You know the West always created enemies. It was the communism, then it became the Islam, then it became something. It is. And a lot of civilians are dying as well in the fighting. So if you were to win this war, how would you reconcile with your people after everything that has happened? Let's be, uh, again, more precise. The problem is not between me and the people. I don't have problem with the people. Because the United States is against me. The West is against me. Many Arab countries, including Turkey, which is not Arab, of course, against me. And if the, people, if the Syrian people are against me, how can I be here? So They're not against you. How They're can not I say against you. If the whole world, or let's say big part of the world, including your people against you, are you a superman? Mm -hmm. You're just a human being. So this is not logical. So if any Syrian could be president, we have many Syrians who are eligible to be in that uh, posi position. You cannot uh, uh, link the whole country only to one uh, person always. But you're fighting for your country. Do you believe that you are the man who can put end to the conflict and restore peace? I have to be the man who can do that, and I hope so. I have. But it's mm -hmm. not about the power of the president. It's about the whole society. Mm -hmm. I have to be precise about this. The president cannot do anything without institutions and without uh, support of the people. So the fight now is not the president's fight. It's Syrians' fight. Every Syrian is involved in defending his country now. Mama Hussein for different reasons, and now they wanted to create a new enemy as Bashar. So they said the problem is the president, so he has to leave. That's why we have to focus on the real problem, not to waste our time listening to what they say. But do you personally believe, still believe, that you are the only man who can hold Syria together and the only man who can put an end what the world calls a civil war? Uh, we have to look at it from two aspects. The first aspect is the Constitution, and I have my authority through the Constitution. According to this, uh, to this authority and to the Constitution, I have to be able to solve the problem. But if, uh, if we mean it that you don't have any other Syrian who can be president, no, 